Welcome back. In the last two lectures, we covered the traditional investigative tools that are available to law enforcement, namely subpoenas and warrants. We also covered the basic structure of the Fourth Amendment. With those building blocks in place, we're now going to begin our deep dive into procedures that are specific to electronic surveillance. This lecture gets us started with wiretapping of phones and wiretap orders. I want to consider wiretapping in three parts. First, searches under the Fourth Amendment. We'll look at how the Supreme Court has defined searches and why a wiretap requires a special kind of warrant. Second, we'll work through the statutory requirements imposed by the Wiretap Act, which are intended to comport with the Supreme Court's views. Finally, I'll share a little data about wiretaps in practice. So, let's start with searches under the Fourth Amendment. And the central question is, what constitutes a search? If police conduct isn't a search, then there's no constitutional protection. The old view was that physical intrusions were required for a search. Entering your home, for example, or pulling apart your belongings. Under that view, a telephone conversation just can't be searched. It's not physical. It's intangible. And so, in the 1928 case of Olmstead against United States, the Supreme Court held that a telephone wiretap is not a search. And again, since it's not a search, it's not covered at all by the Fourth Amendment. The court emphasized the amendment's language about persons, houses, papers, and effects, and said, look, a phone conversation just isn't any of those. So, that's the old view. The modern view is that the Fourth Amendment protects privacy expectations. Those expectations can cover physical objects, but they also can cover intangibles. And, in the seminal 1967 case of Cats Against United States, the Supreme Court held that a telephone wiretap can be a search. It expressly overturned the Olmstead ruling. And, famously, the court held that the Fourth Amendment protects people, not places. In other words, it's about privacy expectations, not just physical intrusions. The test that emerged from that case, specifically from Justice Harlan's concurrence, has two parts. First, there has to be a subjective expectation of privacy. In more plain English, the question is, did the person who's claiming a Fourth Amendment violation actually think there was privacy? In practice, this issue doesn't get litigated so much. Just about every criminal defendant who seeks suppression says, yeah, I expected privacy. And just about every civil plaintiff who's seeking damages says, yeah, I expected privacy. So, the difficult issues tend to come up in the second part of the test. It requires a societally reasonable expectation of privacy. In other words, would a hypothetical ordinary person in this situation think there was privacy? Now you might be going, gee, that seems like a pretty wishy-washy judgment call. And you'd be absolutely right. Even justices on the Supreme Court have been highly critical of the Katz test. One common concern is that it's easy for a judge to impose what they think a reasonable privacy expectation is, and not what society thinks. Another concern is that Katz is circular. Privacy expectations are, in part, a reflection of the law. They are also a reflection of police practices. If courts allow a form of surveillance, or police just start using a form of surveillance, society might come to expect it as reasonable. These views 
are sometimes dubbed a one-way ratchet for privacy. Yet another concern is that there are economic and social pressures to give up some privacy. Social networking and cloud computing, for example, involve handing over your data to businesses. If privacy expectations are largely informed by the private sector, government privacy is going to be dragged down by the same influences as commercial privacy. So, there's the CATS test and the criticisms of CATS. Ever since, it has been clearly established that ordinary police wiretapping of phone conversations is covered by the Fourth Amendment. In a companion case to CATS, the Supreme Court suggested what exactly the Fourth Amendment requires for an ordinary police wiretap. That companion case was Berger against New York, and the court indicated a number of safeguards would be required. The basic ingredient, of course, is a warrant. That comes with the usual probable cause and particularity requirements. In this context, we're talking about probable cause, that the phone conversation will provide evidence of a crime, and particularity about which phone conversations to intercept. In addition to a warrant, the Berger opinion suggests some other requirements. They include a firm time limit for the wiretap, which is relatively short and doesn't leave discretion to officers. Another requirement is that to renew a wiretap, there has to be a new determination of probable cause and particularity. The court also indicated that individuals who have been wiretapped have to eventually receive notice of the wiretap. Finally, the court called for minimization of wiretaps. The idea is that if police are listening in and a conversation isn't pertinent to their investigation, they have to stop listening in. Put differently, the police have to minimize their collection of communications. We're going to see policies also called minimization in the context of foreign intelligence, but they're not minimization of collection. They function very differently. Okay, so putting together everything we've just learned from Katzenberger, a wiretap requires a special court order to satisfy the Fourth Amendment. So, there's the doctrine of searches and wiretaps under the Fourth Amendment. After the Katz and Berger cases, Congress responded by implementing the Constitution's safeguards with a statutory scheme. That scheme was implemented as Title III of the Omnibus Crime Control and Safe Streets Act of 1968. Since that's a mouthful, it's usually just called Title III, or the Wiretap Act. It establishes a blanket prohibition on collection, use, and disclosure of the contents of private phone calls and other electronic communications. It then sets out some exceptions to those prohibitions, one of which is a wiretap order. The procedure works much like a traditional warrant. Law enforcement provide an affidavit and proposed order. A judge reviews them for compliance with the Wiretap Act's myriad requirements. And if the judge finds those requirements satisfied, he can issue a wiretap order. Police then take their wiretap order and serve it on the target's phone company. The company responds by providing technical assistance historically by actually physically patching police into the target's phone line. In more modern practice, they use a slightly more sophisticated interface called the J standard. More about that soon when we talk about the Communications Assistance to Law Enforcement Act. Once the police are wired up, they can listen in. The Wiretap Act implements all of the burger requirements that we saw earlier. It also limits wiretaps to specific listed offenses and requires officers to explain why they have exhausted more traditional forms of surveillance. So, there's quite a burden and an awful lot of paperwork involved in getting a wiretap order. 
The Wiretap Act's provisions also include a civil cause of action for unlawful wiretapping. There are criminal offenses for wiretapping without a valid exception. The Wiretap Act also provides for suppression of unlawful wiretap evidence. And finally, the Wiretap Act requires annual reporting by law enforcement agencies and the judiciary on wiretap practices. I've prepared this table to help you keep straight the requirements of a wiretap order. We're going to fill it in with other sorts of court orders soon. All right, those are the basics of the Wiretap Act. Now let me say a little about wiretapping in practice. This chart depicts wiretap order authorizations since 1997. There are a couple of trends that I want to make sure to note. One is that state wiretaps outnumber federal wiretaps. This is primarily a state practice. Second, usage of wiretaps is growing. It's roughly doubled in the past decade. Let me make a few other points about wiretapping in practice. The overwhelming majority of wiretap orders are used on telephones. Wiretaps can be used for other sorts of communications, as we will see, but telephones are the norm. Almost all of the uses of wiretapping are in narcotics investigations, the overwhelming majority. Also, each order sweeps in about 100 people on average. That's because people use their phones to call lots of other people. Finally, each order sweeps in about 3,000 conversations on average. That's because people use their phones a lot. So there's a little wiretapping by the numbers. That concludes what I wanted to say about wiretaps in practice, and it brings to a close the material on wiretaps. I've prepared a table that summarizes how wiretap orders work. As the course progresses, we'll add more orders to the table. In the next lecture, we're going to look at how law enforcement can access historical call records and account information.